Delighted to say I'm joined by David Goff. I'm sure there's plenty of interesting ways to describe you, but for the purposes of this chat, I'm going to introduce you as the GEA's first openly gay top level match official. You're very welcome. Thanks. Tell us first of all, how did you get into becoming a match official? It was purely by accident. Um, I was a student in St. Patrick's College, Drumcondra, and I was in the canteen having lunch one day, and the um, AIMS development officer, Tom Fitzpatrick, whose job I now have on, on campus, right. arrived into the canteen and there was a children's match on, on the pitch outside and no referee had arrived. And Tom knew that I was interested in tennis umpiring and also that I played a good level of Gaelic games. So he threw me a whistle and he said, go out there and make yourself 40 euro. So for a student to go out, 40 euro was a lot of money for me at the time for an hour's work, something that I enjoyed doing. And what I didn't know about Tom that I now know was that Tom was the top match officials tutor inside in Crow Park in the stadium. So he was tutoring the likes of Brian Gavin, Pat McEnany, uh, Brian Crow. And afterwards he said to me, look, this is something you should really take up, something you're very good at. Um, if I get you a few more games, will you do a referees course? And I thought, fine. So I was doing three children's games a week, 120 euro in my back pocket as a student. And I went back to Mead and did my referees course. And I started refereeing in 2008 and I never looked back. So no ambitions growing up, no eyes on one day being a referee out there? And no, I always wanted to play. I always wanted to play out in, in Crow Park and I had been to Mead Trials plenty of times and performed really well at them. I played a good level of football, but I was too small. Mead was seen as this kind of hard, you know, um, tough team and I just wasn't the right size and the right fit for Sean, uh, Sean Boylan. So I never had the opportunity to play out there. And it was just by chance that I, I ended up in, in refereeing. And I never had any ambitions even starting out um, when I started refereeing in the, the, the primary schools leagues that I would go anywhere in, in, in Gaelic games. I work with a lot of young men in my therapy practice and quite a few of them are there to discuss their sexuality. And some really grapple with the prospect or the possibility that they may be gay and it's a very distressing question for them. Can you remember what was that like for you back then? It was awful. I remember coming to terms with it um, and realising that there was something different about me, that you know, I didn't fit the, what the norm was for my friends uh, when I was in university. And I, that was at the age of 18, and I spent the next nine years of my life in and out of relationships with girls, trying to wear the mask until the mask got too heavy to wear and I couldn't wear it anymore. Right up until the age of 27, I was in sort of heterosexual relationships, um, covering my tracks at, at every turn. And, and, and it's, it's a horrible experience to go through, to live your life and not live it as yourself and to always be wondering, did people know, were you keeping it well enough a secret? Um, was there anything that was going to give you away? Was it the way that you stood, the way that you sounded? And it was really, really difficult. And, and alcohol played a part in it, you know, because it was much easier to deal with when, we, when I had an awful lot more alcohol in me. And my friends would kind of say, oh, sure, he's just having a good night out. But I couldn't deal with being in the nightclubs, hanging around with the lads. The expectation was that you were going to pick up a girl, you know, or end up with a girl at the end of the night. And it was, it was, a, long, it was a long time struggle. So this is from the age of about 18. Yeah. Did you consider speaking to people around you, did you have options? I didn't know anyone. I didn't know anyone to speak to. There was no gay openly men in, in, in my parish. None? There was zero. Not, not one person you could point at in the community and not say one. that's an openly gay not man? When, not when I was 18, no. So as a young person in, in a small village, um, I had no role models, nobody to look up to and nobody to turn to. I didn't, I didn't know where to go. It was something that I just had to deal with myself. And that's a typical traditional Irish family thing, yeah, you know, where you, yeah. you, you don't wash your dirty clothes in public. You keep your stories, your private matters to yourself and you deal with them. God forbid that you'd ever speak to someone about them. What was the fear? What was the fear if, if I tell friends, if I tell family and then they know? So there's a fear, first of all, that you're going to let people down. So that's the family aspect of it, I think, that your parents would have hopes and aspirations for you as a young person that you're going to have in a successful career, that you grow up, get married uh, to a woman, have uh, children and provide grandchildren for my parents. Uh, and there was that fear that, that I was going to let them down because of their hopes and aspirations for me. 
And then there's also the fear then, I suppose, of the wider community, the GAA, the players that I played on the pitch with, that they were going to start to treat me differently because they knew something different about me that they'd never known before. They knew about my sexuality. Would they want to hang around with me? Would I still be welcome in the local pub to have a few drinks? Um, would they continue to invite me to, you know, their social occasions, be it weddings, their children's communions, confirmations, birthday parties? I just felt that for some reason, people were going to start to treat me as someone different. So we're here today talking about inclusion. Your answer there makes it out that you felt that if they knew, it would lead to just widespread exclusion. That's right, yeah. That, that is the huge fear. And I'm happy to sit here and say that it's an irrational fear. I could, could okay. not have experienced, you know, anything more different than what I thought because there was just an outpouring of love and um, a huge sense of, well, we don't really care. It's really nothing got to do with any of us. It m makes no difference to us. It doesn't change who you are as a person. So it, it doesn't, doesn't bother us in the slightest. Were those chats difficult? Hugely difficult. I couldn't even initiate them. So if who, I, did you, who did you start with? Well, I start with my, with my, with my best friend was my cousin. So I okay. told her on a Friday evening um, down home, we were at a, a family 30th birthday party. And then it took me until Sunday. I had the whole thing planned that I was going to tell my parents and my brother at the one time. And I left it till so late Sunday evening because I knew I was going back to Dublin, um, back to work Sunday evening. But at six o'clock, I called them into the kitchen. And I can remember the anxiety and the fear and the stress. It was like someone had a belt around my chest and was pulling at the belt. And um, I could see the expectation on my mother's face. And what I didn't know then, but I know now, was I had a girlfriend up until a month beforehand. And she thought I was after getting my girlfriend pregnant. So you can imagine the shock when I turned around to her and said, you know, uh, I have a, a new partner and his name is, I couldn't even say the words, I am gay, you know? And my father was completely silent. He was just processing it. Um, my mother got upset. My brother, um, being the typical country lad that he is, said, you know, you sure you just don't want to grow up as, you know, a bachelor and just not get married? And it was trying to process all those thoughts and, it, I left pretty soon afterwards, you know, and it had taken me so long to come on my journey to tell them this secret that I suppose it was only fair that I gave them time to go on their journey to be okay with it. I'm glad it didn't take them the years, only a few short weeks to come to terms with it. It was an extremely difficult conversation to have and then it seeped out to extended uh, family and there was no issue there. It was the lads and, 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 and telling the lads on the football team that caused the most anxiety because they were people I had hung around with from when I was in junior infants. I'd gone to school with them in the local school from a very young age, um, hung around with them, went to their birthday parties, secondary school, played football with them every weekend and trained twice a week. And they were my closest friends, but I couldn't even tell them. And I ended up missing a championship match in May 2011. Could not bring myself to go to the championship match. And it was the first championship match in 10 years that I didn't go to uh, as part of, of the team. And I went to a, an LGBT tennis tournament on in Dublin in an attempt to try and make some friends because I really needed to make friends within the LGBT community. And I was good at tennis and I knew it was something that I'd fit very well into. And they rang on the Sunday night of the match and they were all in the pub having their few drinks afterwards and the captain rang. And he said, Dave, we're, we're hearing a few rumours as to why you didn't come to the game today and I won't believe them unless you tell me. And I said, right, um, well, yeah, the, the rumours are probably true. I am gay. And he said, and what's the problem? And I said, well, I, I don't know what, what, what way to, to tell you and I didn't know how you were going to feel about it and it's the whole issue about, you know, showering facilities and, you know, was it an issue for you because it's not an issue for me and there's a huge discussion over a number of different things. And God love him. He just said, look, we really don't care. We love you for exactly who you are. We just want you to play football with us. We want you to be happy. We want you to be sitting here on the bar stool having a few drinks with us. And it was a hugely emotional um, conversation for me and a hugely disappointing moment in my life because I realised for the first time ever that I didn't give my friends the opportunity to support me when I needed them most. And I felt bad that I didn't trust them enough with this information. Wow. You had no expectation that that would be the response? No. 
And I can remember putting down the phone and being very upset afterwards that I had all this support, I had all this friendship, I had everything that I needed to support me to come out, but I didn't trust in them because of my own irrational fears. And had you heard things or seen things over the years which, looking back, you might think, well, well that's kind of why I thought it. There would have been things said in dressing rooms or things that would have happened on the football field or language used, not in any direct way to uh, make me feel any way less, but it would have chipped away a little bit at yeah. my confidence. And I might have just thought at the time, I don't know if I can come out to these guys. I don't know whether they're ready for this. Um, I don't know if I'm ready for it. And I didn't know if I had, would have the strength to come out and tell my story and continue to play sport with them, knowing the way that they spoke about certain things. And that was difficult. That, that, that constant chipping away of your confidence all the time made it just that little bit harder to have that conversation with them. How was it then, the first time in training, the first matches, uh, the first, how were they all? Yeah, that was really funny when I went back because they were overly conscious around me. <laughs> they then. overcompensated. They overcompensated. And right. they were, can we have the banter with them? What are we allowed to say? What are we not allowed to say? You know, and it took a while for them to get used to the kind of dynamic, which really didn't change at all because most of what they were saying was genuinely funny and it wasn't um, to offend me. And I've always said to them, look, once your humour is not directed at offending someone that it's genuinely funny. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm always going to laugh. So after a while, you know, it settled down and, and they got very used to having me around and, you know, being, you know, some of them would have, you know, jokes about, you know, and, and they were careful about the type of language they used. But they got used to it and they were much more comfortable around me and knew what they could slag me about and what, what not to slag me about. and. Uh, just made for a much happier relationship for me and a much, a much nicer dressing room. And within two years, someone else had come out on the team after me. And that was a huge moment for me to see someone else comfortable in being able to say to the same team, oh, well, I'm also gay. Tell me about being a GEA ref as all this is going on. Are, are you wondering whether the GEA might have a view on this or would it would impact your career as a match official? I was never worried from that aspect. For me, the GAA refereeing was an obvious out for me from the dressing room scenario where I was struggling. Okay. So I was leaving the dynamic of having a, a team of 20 or 30 men to being isolated on my own, you know, and I was going to the games on my own, you know, the dressing room. I had umpires with me, but they were family. It was a much smaller uh, team and they were a much closer team. So it was an obvious out also around the, the, the sharing issue, which I didn't have an issue with, but I didn't know whether the teammates were mm -hmm. going to have an issue with. Consequently, they didn't. There was no issue whatsoever. Um, but for me at the time, with all those irrational fears, refereeing was a much safer place for me to be than what I thought the, the um, team dressing room was. I never thought that I would tell the GAA about my sexuality. I thought that I would keep it private. And I suppose from 2011 until 2015, I did. I didn't feel there was an environment there safe enough for me to come out publicly. So it, it was never something that, that reared its head. How did it happen? How did they find out? How did you tell them? <sighs> I told them it ended up front page of the Sunday Independent. That's how, how it just, you know, the gates completely opened. So it was the week before um, a match just here between Tyrone and Dublin in the leagues. And I had listened to Leo Varadkar come out on the Miriam O'Callaghan show a number of weeks beforehand. And I said to myself, look, if the future leader of this country can do that on national airwaves, surely the environment is now safe for me to be who I am within this association. So I decided to try and wear a rainbow wristband at, during the match here um, back in March in 2015. And in the week in the build up to that, um, it was quite a stressful week, a lot of anxiety. I told my parents and my family that I was going to do this, my friends. I had to tell my school that I was also going to do it because it was illegal for me to work as an openly gay man in the school because I contravened the Catholic ethos of the school. That legislation was still in at the time. So I was taking a huge risk. And thankfully, I had the support of my principal and my board of management. And they said, look, Dave, go ahead, do this. Then I asked the GAA, 
and they said no. A couple of very high profile people within the association said not to do it, that it was going to ruin my referee career, that it would prevent me from getting to where I wa wanted to go, and that I would never get to referee the All-Ireland Final that I always wanted to. But then I asked my friends in the gay community, and they said, look, Ireland needs this. The conversations are happening at the moment in the run-up to the marriage equality referendum. People are telling personal stories. These stories are needed to carry the referendum. And your story is going to be hugely significant mm -hmm. because it's going to move the referendum outside of Dublin. It needs to get to the tables of GA families around the country that are not having that discussion. And the GA permeates every level of Irish society. In every corner of the country, there's a club. So I knew the power the story would have. And when I spoke to the Sunday Independent, um, the sports editor of the Sunday Independent is actually the chairman of my local club in Slane. And he said, Dave, we don't want to run this story. And I said, John, I'm not asking you for permission. I'm asking you, do you want the story or not? So they wrote the story the week in advance of the match. And I had agreed with them that would happen because I didn't want to do any media after the match or on the day of the match. The match was number one focus for me. And when the GA found out this was happening, initially it was okay, but then it was, you can't wear the wristband out on the pitch. You can wear it in the dressing room, but not onto the pitch. I said, no, I have nothing to hide. Okay, we let you wear it from the dressing room to the edge of the pitch. You can do your photos there, but you can't step across the white line onto the pitch. And I said, this is ridiculous. Like, what is the issue with one foot either side of the line? And eventually on Saturday morning of the match, and half seven, I received a phone call from Croke Park to say, Dave, you're not allowed to wear the wristband. And as a referee, if I can't uphold the rules of the association, then who could? So I put the wristband away and the story had been written. And I had said to Croke Park that morning, well, you're going to have to deal with the fallout from this because peace has been written. And what was supposed to be a very small piece released at seven o'clock that evening when I threw up the ball about a call for a yes vote from someone within the GAA turned into a much bigger piece and it moved from the sports section to the front page of the Sunday Independent. I remember my father the following morning, I woke up and he rang me. He had gone to local mass in Slain and the shopkeeper he'd gone into by bread the following morning. And nobody knew too much about my sexuality in Slain at the time. And he opened the shop door, and the shopkeeper looked at him, as, as shopkeepers in local areas do, he said, see your front fellas on the front page of the Independent. My father just turned white, he told me, went over, picked up the, the paper, and there it was, front page of the Independent. And I remember going home to Slane that afternoon. It's the only time, apart from my grandfather's funeral, that I saw my grandmother cry. And I had come to the realisation that even though I had been openly gay for four years. My family had kept it secret. They had never had the conversation with their friends or the neighbours or people who were important in their life. I could see the realisation now was that they were worried about what the neighbours were thinking or what the neighbours would say or what people were going to think when, when they found out. And they were upset over that. And that was hugely upsetting for me four years later to come to that realisation. And it took a number of weeks for them to get over it. it. Took a number of weeks for them to get over it. I remember going to mass. I I had finished going to mass a long time after I came out, and my brother had a daughter who was being baptised at Easter vigil mass. It was a special thing um, when they blessed the the water, the new water for Easter. But the child is baptised during mass rather than after mass, so I had to go to mass. And I was the godfather, and I was brought up onto the altar in front of 250 people in the local church. And I could just feel all the eyes looking at me. And the priest was wired up in his, his little microphone. And as I walked onto the altar, in front of everyone, he said, I see you're causing a bit of a fuss lately. I thought, oh no, this, this, is, this is not the conversation I want to have on the altar of the church in Slane. And I just nodded my head and I said, oh yeah, Joe. And he said, don't worry, everything will work out. And that was uh, it. Once my grandmother heard that, that was it. And I, I never looked back and my family never have since. Wow. It, it, it's quite a 
personal story, though, to be like catapulted onto the front page of a newspaper like that, particularly at a time when this was a very live issue around the country. Like, what was it like being you over those few months? I suppose I went through a range of emotions afterwards. Um, the media scrutiny in the week following that was immense. I had never been subject to media scrutiny like that, per certainly not about my personal life, maybe about refereeing, but not, not my personal life. And it took its toll. Um, I remember heading away to, to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, to get away for a weekend because I just said to the GA, I, I, need, I need some time off from this. Um, and I did, I needed that break, I needed to get away. And when I came back, the marriage equality referendum had ramped up quite a bit. And there was a great sense and feeling among the LGBT community that it was going to be carried. So what was something that was very anxious for me at the time turned into something very positive, And by May, something very celebratory. Um, so I went through a whole range of emotions in a very short space of time in about eight weeks. <laughs> You said you didn't have any openly May Gale, gay role models in your community, none that you were aware of. And now at this point in your life, you're a very prominent one on a national level. You must have been getting all sorts of messages in private. What were they like? I had to, first of all, remove a lot of the messages initially because they weren't so positive. Oh, I mean, really? Um, as a referee, we don't have a team of supporters in the stadium. I always manage to annoy one half of the stadium yeah. with some of my decisions and five minutes later annoy the other half. So initially, um, because people, I suppose, didn't understand, didn't know uh, too much about me, um, some of the comments were extremely negative. But as the years passed, the, the, the messages changed. And I don't think I've received a message like that in, in quite a number of years. The messages now are, are, are people reaching out, people struggling with their own sexuality in, in their communities, in their GA clubs. They are messages from moms and dads, brothers, partners of young men who have committed suicide in GA clubs in recent years, who've struggled with their sexuality and, and coming out in that kind of toxic masculine environment. Um, and, and it takes its toll. You know, some Monday mornings you wake up and, and you, in your Twitter private messages, and there's someone there overly emotional because they've lost a loved one, and they're reaching out to you for some sense of support. And you, you know, I'm not a counsellor. I'm not, a, a, you know, I'm very careful about the advice I give. Um, I will always listen. Um, and my story was very personal, and that's the only advice I can actually give is in relation to my story. But I know. My story doesn't fit everybody else's. And normally it's just to, to offer, you know, my condolences, listen, and then, you know, provide the names or numbers of people within professional services that they can pick up the phone to. I, I, I know you're, you're strong on the need for role models um, and you've explained really well how you got to the point of being the one. Does it ever feel like a burden? Are you looking around going, why am I still the only one? Because I know I'm not the only one, but why is it just me? I, I would ask that question, but I wouldn't see it as a burden. I, I never okay. see this as a burden. It's not something that I feel heavy to carry. I'm quite happy to sit back and have the conversations and be very open about my lifestyle, why I chose to do it and what I hope to see to change in the future. But I do ask the question, we're six years down the road from marriage equality. Um, I still am the only person involved in elite sports in this country, professional or amateur, that's openly gay. And the question needs to be asked now, the conversation needs to start as to why people do not feel comfortable in coming out as an openly gay male athlete in this country. Is it, is it too simplistic to ask, like, what is the answer to that? I, I don't think there is any one answer. It's a yeah. very layered answer and I would have my opinions on it, but they might be different to other people, and, and everyone's opinion on this is, is, is quite valid. I think we are dealing with in dressing rooms centuries of hegemonic masculinity, and layered on top of that then, toxic masculinity within the dressing room scenario. I've experienced it myself. I don't think it's um, conscious. I don't think they know 
what they are doing or the difficult environment that, that, that men have created in the dressing room. Um, and that needs to change first. But it's an education piece. It's around educating people as to what they can do to create the safe spaces for people. We had to wait until December last year before the GA involved itself with a Rainbow Laces campaign. And this is the type of thing I'm talking about. It's, it's not just for me. Everyone would expect me to wear the Rainbow Laces, and that's fine. It's about the players wearing them. It's about the people from the straight community being our allies and standing up and saying, we are okay with this. This is something we have no issue with and we will support you if you want to come out. And that's the, the powerful statement that needs to be made now. It needs to come from the straight community rather than the gay community. Can the GAA itself be doing anything differently? Well, it is. It's doing an awful lot more different than it was in 2015. Right. I mean, we, you know, and then we didn't dare speak about that again until 2019. And then all of a sudden, within six months in 2019, we had a diversity and inclusion officer. We had walked in pride. Um, we had a work group looking at gender diversity. And um, we have moved on now to education pieces around uh, homophobia in sport. We've rules brought in in the association now that were never in before about language that's homophobic or anti-inclusion. And there's a diversity and inclusion conference in, in Crow Park. This all has happened inside the last 24 months. There's a massive leap from where they were, where they were doing nothing in January 2019 to where we are now in 2021. That's huge when it's you phrase it like that. It's absolutely massive. We're, the association is 130 odd years old and they did nothing around LGBT issues until 2019. And we're talking May 2019. And we're sitting here now in June 2021, 24 months later. And all this has happened in such a short space of time. It's needed though, isn't it? It's badly needed. It's, it's, it's badly needed because I, I feel that nobody else within this association should ever have to go through what I went through. And that's the reason we're here. That's the reason that I continue to do this, to still be visible and to make my voice heard. Because if I can change that for one young person in their lifetime, that they don't have to feel unwelcome or unbelonging in this association, well then, you know, my work is done.